Open your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians at chapter 9, verse number 15. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Thank you, you may be seated. Grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. This last Sunday of this year, I want to talk to us about God gift wrapped. God gift wrapped. In this season of Christmas and giving, untold millions of dollars has been spent not only on gifts but on wrapping paper. There are people who just love wrapped gifts. Not only do they love gifts that are wrapped, they like to wrap gifts. And then you give them a gift and they unwrap it and look at it and put it back in the box and, and wrap it again. Because they are more in love with the wrapping, I think, than with the gift. Those of us who have raised children spent money on toys and they played with the gift wrapping. They took the toys out of the box and got in the box. So we could have just bought the box and, and saved a lot of money. And then there are those of us who are into regifting. We have received gifts that we don't particularly care for. And rather than hurt our giver's feelings, we gush and make over the gift, put it aside to re-gift to somebody that we forgot about their birthday or we forgot about Father's Day. We just pick out that gift that was given to us at Christmas and re-gift. 40% of gifts that have been wrapped and given has been returned. Amazon got sick of y'all returning gifts for free, so they start charging a dollar for every gift that you had to return. And then there's the ultimate insult of giving a gift for the person to say to you that they don't want it or that they didn't like it. Or they'll take it, but they would have preferred something else. Or there are those people who just ultimately insult by returning a gift to the giver. Gifts are so inseparably linked with Christmas that we can scarcely think of December 25th without thinking about giving gifts. And with all the giving, and with all the receiving that happens at Christmas time, it is altogether lovely that we reflect upon God's gift to us. Reflecting on God's generosity in giving his son, the Apostle Paul pondered the words of our text this morning and a brilliant man, Paul, a brilliant man, 
with a broad vocabulary who wrote over half the scripture in the New Testament. No man other than Jesus was a greater theological mind. And Paul, with all of his knowledge, spoke 13 languages, seven of them fluently. He stammers at speech when he came to this four-letter word, gift. Although Paul spoke several languages, he could not find any word in existence in his day that could describe God's gift. So Paul's theology leads to a stunning doxology. When he runs out of words, he just starts praising. And for the indescribable gift, the gift that is beyond telling, Paul and Paul reminds us, for that gift, we ought to give thanks. The term that he uses signifies, brothers and sisters, that this gift cannot be narrated, it cannot be recounted, and it cannot be told. It implies a story that is beyond all telling, that again and again calls forth amazement, wonder, and praise. It involves God's self-giving in the person of Jesus Christ. The wonder of his taking upon himself our poverty, our sin, and our guilt. To attempt to define the gift, uh, to, to put it down in words to try to describe it without reserve would violate Paul's intentional silence on the matter. The story of God's gift of himself for our salvation cannot be finally told in full. It is unspeakably wonderful and yet because it is unspeakably wonderful, precisely for that reason, it must be spoken again and again. It can never be explained. It can never be exhausted. It can never be defined. It can never be described. It is the issue ever afresh in thanksgiving praise and song because all the gifts of God are good. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness, there is no shadow of turning. All God's gifts are good but there is one in which in its intrinsic value is inestimably more important than all of God's other gifts. So much so that without exaggeration Paul says that gift is indescribable. Uh, brothers and sisters um, we were we were lost and none but Christ could find us. We were dead, but none but Christ could raise us. We were sunk, but none but Christ could recover us. We were afar off, but none but Christ could bring us in. We were guilty, None but Christ could secure our pardon. A gift may be very expensive and bestowed with great generosity, yet not be what the person needs. 
because a whole lot of gifts that we have given this year perhaps people already have and they just graciously accepted it or it was not something that they needed but they did not want to hurt the feeling of the gift giver but they took it despite the fact it did not meet their greatest need but this gift that God sent is eternally efficacious efficacious is a pretty word that means it's what you need if we had needed knowledge he would have sent us a philosopher if we had needed money, he would have sent us a banker. If we had needed healing, he would have sent us a doctor. But since we needed salvation, he sent us a savior. And not just any savior, but he came himself. Brothers and sisters, may it never be lost on us that he was born in Bethlehem and wrapped in swaddling clothes. I, I, don't want you to, I, don't want you to, I don't want you to overlook that when you, when you look at the manger out in the vestibule or when you, or when you think about the Christmas story. Don't, 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 don't look at it as sweet and warm, and that it is, sweet and warm, but, but there's something underneath that that I want you to see. He was born in Bethlehem, of Judea. Bethlehem, the house of bread. He is the bread of life. Born in the house of bread. Wrapped in swaddling clothes. Bethlehem, the house of bread, the bread of life wrapped, laid in a feeding trough. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Bethlehem, house of bread, Jesus, bread of life, wrapped, put in a feeding trough. If you would see him, you've got to recognize that he was bread born in bread, wrapped, put in a trough to be fed upon. Bread of heaven. Bread of heaven. I wish I had somebody to help me. Feed me. I wish I had some noise right here. Every time I look at that Bethlehem baby, I see bread wrapped in bread in a feeding trough and when I feed on it, I go away satisfied. And if you are hungry this morning, he's the bread of life. Uh, Mary wrapped him and laid him in the manger. But for me to see him, I have to unwrap him. Um, let me see. He's wrapped in prophecy. And if I would see him as prophecy fulfilled, I have to unwrap it. Let me, let me, let me unwrap him in prophecy. I've been talking to you about it all the month. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6 is Jesus wrapped in prophecy. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. 
and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. He solves my confusion. Mighty God, he shelters me in my conflict. Everlasting Father, he showers me with compassion. Prince of Peace, he soothes my conscience. Everything I need is in that baby. He's wrapped in prophecy. Every type is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. The ark that Noah got in, that's Jesus. That basket that Moses was put in is Jesus. That showbread that was in the temple is Jesus. That ephod that David put on is Jesus. That fire in the burning bush, I wish I had a witness. The captain of the Lord's host that showed up to fight for Gideon. That wheel in the middle of a wheel that Ezekiel saw. That horse pouring in the valley, that's Jesus. Every type in the Old Testament is a portrait, a foreshadowing of Jesus. He's wrapped in prophecy. He's prophecy fulfilled. There are over 700 prophetic utterances of Jesus in the Old Testament and every last one of them has already come true. And the only way you can tell if a person is a prophet is if what they say is fulfilled. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. That already happened. Uh, he shall come forth as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He's without form nor comeliness. When we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. With his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep. I wish I had a Bible reader. Have gone astray. But God has laid on him the iniquity of us. All of that has already come true. She shall bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. That's already been fulfilled. He is prophecy fulfilled. But not only this morning as a hurry do we unwrap him in prophecy. We need to unwrap him in history. Because he is prophecy fulfilled. Which means he is history concluded. Um, he's the already, not yet. He is inauguration and consummation. Beginning the end. The first and the last. Alpha and Omega. History is concluded in him because it's his story. Uh, let me see if I can make that make sense. 
Galatians at chapter 4, verse 4 and 5 says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. In the proto evangelium Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 the seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent the serpent shall bruise his heel finds its history its consummation in Galatians chapter 4 a woman would bring forth a son who would crush the head of the serpent. We got in trouble with a woman. God delivered us with a woman. We got in trouble in a garden. God delivered us in another garden. We got in trouble with a tree. God saved us with a tree. When the fullness of time had, when God got ready. And, and, and you here who are waiting on somebody in your family to get saved, they're going to get saved when God gets ready. Because God knows how to send enough trouble. God knows how to send enough heartbreak. God knows how to send enough shortage to make them come to their senses because you and I would not be here this morning if God didn't get ready to save us. I need somebody here who can remember what it was like before you knew God and what it's been like since you met God. Somebody ought to help me preach here. People see your glory, but they don't know your story. Don't, 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 don't judge me by the heights that I've attained. Judge me by how far I had to come to get to where I am. Don't be envious of somebody else's blessings because you don't know what they've been through to get to where they are. Don't get mad with nobody because they're shouting and raising their hands and praising God because you don't know what's going on in their lives or what went on in their yesterdays or what they're looking for God to do in their tomorrows or what God has already done. You can't make me doubt him. I know too much about him. He's opened too many doors. I wish I had some noise here. He's made too many ways. He's raised up too many friends. And he's put down too many enemies. Folk who thought I'd never make it got to look up at me now. Look how far God has brought you. Look what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, yes, sir. the reason I can shout so loud, yes, sir. the reason I can give God my best hallelujah yes, sir. is because when I was cut off from the covenants of promise, yeah, yeah. Thank you, God. When, I was, when I was barred from being a part of the household of Israel, I'm not an Israelite by birth. I'm not the seed of Abraham by birth. So in order for God to own me, he had to adopt me. And with adoption comes all the rights and privileges of natural born children. So whatever Jesus has, I have. Whoever Jesus is, I am because I have been adopted by my father. 
If you would shout this morning, you would unwrap him in prophecy. If you would give God glory this morning, you would unwrap him in history. Because he's prophecy fulfilled and he's history's conclusion. I'm through. You've got to unwrap him in mystery. He is prophecy fulfilled. He's history concluded. And he's mystery unraveled. The Latins called him Mysterium Tremendum. The awful mystery. Jesus comes to unravel the mystery who is God. We could not know God except he decides to reveal himself. And his self-revelation is Jesus Christ. Um, this woman had asked the pastor to come over to her house to try to help her win her husband to Christ. And the pastor came over and the husband, who would not be disrespectful, he opened the door, let the pastor in. The pastor went through his spiel, shared with him the Roman road, the plan of salvation. And the man was an avid bird watcher and he kept pigeons on his roof. He, he listened to the pastor's story. He respectfully thanked him for coming. Pastor got up to leave, prayed with him. The man bowed his head. He did not want to disrespect his wife's pastor. And he thanked him for coming. And when the pastor left, the man went back to watching the NFL. He's a bird watcher, I told you. Pigeons on his roof. And so when the game was over, he went up to the roof to tend to his pigeons. And one of them just kept flying out and would not come back to roost. So the man tried to get the pigeon. He tried to coax him in with bird seed. He wouldn't come in. He tried to leave the, the, the door open. He, the pigeon would not act right. He just wouldn't come in, kept flying around. And the man thought to himself, if I could become a pigeon, I could communicate with him. If I could become what he is, I could make him understand. And then the light came on. Salvation came to his heart in that moment because he realized that God became what I am to make himself comprehensible. The only way God could make me understand him, he had to become like me. He became a man. But well, now hear me. In him, we find undiminished deity wrapped in perfect humanity. It's what theologians call the hypostatic union. Hypostasis, the hypostatic union is having two complete and distinct natures at the same time and they are not in competition nor are they in contradistinction. Jesus is not 50% man and 50% God. He's 100% man and 100% God, only he's incapable of sin. There is no, I just learned this word this week, there is no posteriority. I like saying that. It just makes me sound smart. All right, all right. There is no posteriority in his coming. And that word posteriority means because he is neither antecedent or subsequent to God. He does not come before or after. He is co eternal, co-existent, co 
regent. He is the same age as his father and younger than his real father could tell us that he is because he says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the same was in the beginning with God. I wish I had one or two more witnesses. That word became flesh which made him in his own doing subsequent to the father yet co-equal. He comes down, but he never loses his holy estate. He self-empties by laying aside the privileges of the Godhead without relinquishing the power of the Godhead. Because when he got, when he got ready to steal, a, to steal a storm, he was sleeping. That's humanity. But he woke up, that's divinity. He was sleeping, that's human. But he said, peace be still, that's divine. Humanly, he was on the way to Jairus' house, but in his divinity, a woman grabbed his clothes and her blood stopped. He was human in that he got hungry, but then he fed the multitude with two fish and five loaves. He stopped being God to be man and stopped being man to be God. And yet remain God and man at the same time. Now you think I'm going back over that again? I don't understand it because it's a mystery. But a mystery is not that which we cannot really truly try to unravel and, and, and intellectually uh, 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 find out in our minds how, to, how you come to it. Some mysteries you just got to believe. You just have to take it as face value and shout about it. Uh, you see it all the time. Maybe this will help you understand. You'll see it all the time. A beautiful woman on the arms of the ugliest man. And you say to yourself, how did this movie star wind up with this loser? How did this gorgeous piece of furniture wind up with this rickety, broke down looking? Come on, come, come on, y'all, quit. I can say that. I'm trying to make a point. They are together mysteriously. Because he asked. Yeah. All right. yeah. I'm a Christian this morning. Because how could a holy God wind up with a trashy, low down, wrongdoing crook like me? I asked. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. And he came into my heart because I asked. Mm. I'm through. I'm finished. It's the last sermon of this year. 
I, I don't have anything else to say this morning but this. I'm so glad I asked. I said, I'm so glad that I asked. Because I almost died here a few years ago. But thank God I asked. I was lost and on my way to hell. But thank God I asked. Somebody was locked behind prison bars. But you asked. And you may not have been in a physical prison, but you could have been in a prison of addiction. You could have been in a prison of a bad relationship. You could have been in a prison made of your own attitude, but you asked him to come into your heart. And here you are this morning, a brand new person with a new lease on life, with a better disposition, a better attitude, a, a happier face and posture and walk and talk because you asked Jesus to deliver you. Don't get mad with me because I shout. Don't grudge me, my hallelujah. Because you don't know how many storms I've come through. You, you, you don't know how many things could have brought me under that the Lord took me over. My soul don't have to look back and wonder. I already know that it was nobody but Jesus. You don't mind if I talk about him a minute, do you? I'm glad I asked him to come into my life. I'm glad he's made the difference in my life because I can shake hands with my enemies. I can love those who don't love me. I can pray for those who despitefully use me. I can bless those that curse me because I know somebody who came in my heart to stay. And that is the man, Jesus Christ. He lives in my soul. I wish I had one or two more witnesses here. I'm about to get happy, brothers and sisters, because when I think about where I came from, that's how you shout. That's how you learn how to shout. That's how you learn how to shout. You got to have a good memory. You got to remember how many roads God brought you over. Uh, how many mountains God led you around? Uh, how many storms God sheltered you in? How many mistakes you made, but God gave you another chance? And when you remember how good God has been, you don't even have to be at Lily Grove. You can be sitting down in your living room. You can be riding on 45 or 288. And you start thinking about God's mercy, God's goodness, God's faithfulness, God's charity, God's grace in your life. Nobody got to tell you to give God some praise. When you think about God's goodness, you just start praising God by yourself. Wherever you are in this sanctuary, or those of you who are watching us online, turn your spot into a sanctuary. Turn that space into a church right now and start giving God your best hallelujah. He brought you through some stuff this year. Oh yes, he has. He's been good to you this year. Oh yes, he has. He's allowed you to retire this year. Oh yes, he has. He's put food on your table this year. Oh yes, he has. He's healed your body this year. Yes, he has. He's given you joy this year. Yes, he has. He put money in your pocket. Yes, he has. He's made a way out of no way. 
Yes, he has. He gave you a good doctor's report. Yes, he has. You were down some days, but he picked you up. Yes, he has. If the Lord been good to you, come on back with me to the roller decks and let's thank God for his goodness. If you look at how good God has been, pull up some blessings right now. He's been a way maker. He's been a problem solver. He's been a burden bearer. He's been a friend when you're friendless. Bread when you're hungry. Company when you're by yourself. A lawyer in a courtroom. Y'all know him, don't you? If he's been good to you, and you don't mind testifying, don't wait until tomorrow to tell him thank you. Don't wait until New Year's to tell him thank you. You might not live to see another year. Tell him right now, thank you for January. Thank you for February. Thank you for what you did in March. Thank you how you kept me in April. Thank you you made a way in May. Thank you you showered me in June. Thank you you walked with me in July. Thank you it was hot in August but you kept my air conditioning running. Thank you for how you kept me in September. Thank you, when leaves started falling, your love never failed. You kept me in October, you walked with me in November. Here it is now, December. You were with me in the first, second, and third, the fourth, fifth, and sixth, the seventh, eighth, and ninth. You walked with me in the 10th, 11th, and 12th. Here it is, the 31st. I still got my health and strength. I still got food in my house. I still got a job in the morning. I still know who I am and whose I am. Thank you for your goodness. Why don't you grab somebody? Don't worry about COVID. God will keep you in perfect peace. If you keep your mind stayed on him, somebody lost a mother this year, but he stepped right in and been a mother for you. Tell him thank you. Somebody lost a job this year, but the next week, God gave you another job. Tell God thank you. Somebody has surgery this year, but you're in here this morning because God is a doctor who's never lost a patient. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, use your preaching voice. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, say it like you mean it. Thank you. 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 If I don't see 2024 now under him. Now under him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding great joy and it all right say yeah say yeah Some good day. 
I've had some hills to climb. I wish I had two or three witnesses. I've had some weary day. And some lonely nights. But when I look around and when I think things over, all of my good days, I wish I had a witness. I'll weigh my bad day so I I won't complain sometimes my clouds hang low I wish I had a believer here I could hardly see the road I asked the question, Lord, have you ever had to do that? Why so much pain, but he knows what's best for me. So I'll just say, thank you, Lord. I, I, I won't complain. I wish I had two or three more hands. God has been good to me. What about you? Just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 